You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Well, good morning, Foundry Church. My name is Phil. Always an honor and a privilege to be back here with you this morning. Two specific blessings for you. If you are a parent of a small child and that small child did not honor daylight savings time with the extra hour of sleep and you were still up very early, blessings to you. Sorry, they didn't honor the agreement we had. Secondly, if you are here and you almost didn't come because you were trying to change the clock on your car radio and you just were ready to just turn around and go home, blessings to you. We will get that car radio changed. We're here for you. So this morning we find ourselves in our fourth week of the water series. We've spent the last three weeks looking at what God loves he leads into in the water. Now, as the video said, we transition to another biblical theme of how God is sending his people not into the water, but through the water. Speaking of through the water, <clears throat> back in 2012, I'll put the picture up here. My family and I, we had the, uh, the privilege of, of taking the trip out to Niagara Falls. We were doing the Maid of the Mist boat tour. We spent a, just about a day there soaking up uh, just that amazing sight that is Niagara Falls. And when we got there, we had a few hours to kill uh, before the boat tour, so you could see us there. We were kind of walking along the Canadian side of the falls, kind of following the river upstream, and I kept kind of standing in awe at the power of the river, right? But there's a, a section, if you go further up river, there's a section where it's not as turbulent as what you see in the picture there. There's a section where it just looks like a river. It's just kind of flat. It's kind of calm. And I kept thinking about how deceptive that must be to see calm water knowing what was just a hundred yards downstream, right? But I also thought you might be disillusioned enough just to think you might be able to swim through that water. And I kept thinking about what would happen if you actually tried it, right? It's, it's the way my mind works. I'm like, I bet I could do it. Like, no, you can't. I bet I, because it's, you know, like I said, it's just calm enough. You're like, oh, maybe you could. So we did the boat ride, and sure enough, if you've done it before, they've got this museum kind of at the end of the Maid of the Mist boat tour, and it shares with you all of these stories of these daredevils who have hopped in wooden barrels and gone over the falls, except some of them weren't daredevils, right? Some people accidentally fell in. And one of those stories that I heard was about a seven-year-old named Roger Woodward. This happened in the 1960s. Roger was out on the river, and he went over Horseshoe Falls. So here's what happened. He's out there, he's seven years old, he's with his sister and an older man and they're fishing. And the motor began to just freeze up on him and next thing they know, they were capsized. And Roger's sister, miraculously, you can see right on the right-hand side of that screen where all the people are, two strangers, two men from New Jersey made a human chain and they rescued her just feet before she went over. But Roger, wearing only a life jacket and a bathing suit, went over Horseshoe Falls. Can you only imagine the fear for that young seven-year-old? Luckily, when the, the boat, they kind of cut as close as they can to the falls and that churning, kicking up mist and foamy waters, and they could see that orange life jacket kind of bobbing. And Roger miraculously had lived. He'd gone over Niagara Falls and he'd lived. And it took him three chances to get that life preserver thrown out to him. On the third one, Roger manages to like claw his way up on it. And they pull him up to the boat. And word starts spreading quickly all throughout Niagara Falls about this miracle for both Roger and his sister. He spent the next three days in the hospital with only a minor concussion. Now... You would think that something like that probably forever changed Roger's life. How could it not, right? If you go over Niagara Falls, how can that not change you? And I heard that Roger occasionally in his adult life now will occasionally go back to Niagara Falls. And, and I had this kind of like deviant thought of like, could you imagine if Roger like, like with all this gusto and bravado walks up to the railing where everyone's doing their selfies and he like just casually is like, you know, I conquered that, right? You're like, it's not that hard. Went over the falls. You know, could you imagine like the gall that it would take to be like, yeah, I conquered that. But I want to come back to that. I want to come circle around to that thought. So this morning though, as we continue with the water series, 
I want us to look at a familiar passage about what happens when God takes us through the waters. And this one is not a metaphorical through the waters. This is a literal through the waters from Exodus 14. And if you've grown up in the church, maybe this story is familiar to you. Maybe you grew up singing the song about all of Pharaoh's men doing the dead men's float. And I want you to approach this with new ears and a new set of eyes and to hear what God might be saying to us this morning. If you are unfamiliar with this story, it's one of those, one of those ones that for Christians we just cling to. It's one of those famous stories of God literally stepping in. And, uh, and maybe you've seen the Hollywood version. Maybe you like your Moses to be a little more Charlton Heston, or maybe you prefer your Moses to be Christian Bale. But either way, let's do a quick recap of the story. It's about Moses, and I'm her- sure you've heard some version of this story. So now, if you backtrack with us to three weeks ago, we talked about Into the Water, and Eric started this series by telling us that Moses, as a baby, his mother set him in that basket as a Hebrew baby boy marked for certain death, set this baby into the hippo-infested waters of the Nile River and had to trust God's sovereignty that God's plan was going to rescue Moses. She literally set what she loved into the Nile River and just left it up to God. If you remember that story from three weeks ago, Moses is rescued by Pharaoh's house and he is raised in a prominent position in the Egyptian kingdom. But then God decides to take him one step further in leadership and call him in this desert moment to follow Yahweh, to follow God. And there's this burning bush type moment in the desert and literally Moses is presented with a mind-blowing plan. The plan simply was this, to march himself back into Egypt, which was at that time the most powerful country on planet Earth and demand that Pharaoh release his entire slave workforce made up of Hebrew people. And it was a mind-blowing plan, all right. Mind-blowing enough to Moses that he begins stuttering, and he begins hyperventilating, and he begins to doubt if he's the right man for the job. But he eventually musters up the courage to help rescue God's people out of slavery. And so we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 14. And again, it's probably one that you're familiar with, but let's approach it with a fresh set of eyes this morning as we look at going through the water. We're going to read Exodus 14. If you have a Bible here, feel free to read along, flip along, tap along on your screen or your device, or you can follow along on the screen. Exodus 14. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. By the way, I wish we were still getting instructions from God verbatim. That would be amazing. Okay, here we go. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by pi Hahiroth between Migdol and the sea. Camp there along the shore across from baal Zephon. Then Pharaoh will think the Israelites are confused. They are trapped in the wilderness, and once again I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am am the Lord. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. When word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done letting all of these Israelite slaves get away, they asked. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called up his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's best chariots along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its commander. Then the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so he chased after the people of Israel, who had left with fists raised in defiance. The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all of his horses and chariots, and charioteers and his troops. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped beside the shore near Pihaharoth, across from Baal-Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Which subsequently is what every teenager has said to their parents on every camping trip since. Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? 
Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians will see, you see today will never be seen again. And the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots, and his charioteers, when my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. Then the angel of God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. God had literally hemmed them in. The clouds settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and the Israelites did not approach each other all night. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Theater of the mind. In my social deviancy, I wonder if you could have just poked it as you walked through the wall of water, just drag a hand right through that sheer wall of water on each side. Then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and charioteers chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here, away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. When the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, raise your hand back over the sea again. Then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and their charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. The waters returned and covered all of the chariots and the charioteers and the entire army of Pharaoh, all of the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea. Not a single one survived. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Literally, through the water. Now, it's an incredible story, right? And we could spend weeks on the ramifications of this text alone. We could spend sermon after sermon talking about the miraculous. We could spend hours talking about God's heartbeat against injustice and against the slavery of his people. But there's three things, Foundry, that I hope, just three things that we can pull from this text that I believe God would want to say to us directly as the Foundry Church. Three takeaways this morning of what it means to go through the water. The first one is this. Our first takeaway Our resumes mean very little, but God's glory does. What did verse 4 say when we started this? God said, I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. This wasn't about Moses. Notice he didn't say, I planned this in order to display my glory through Moses. It was about his glory, not ours. In the end, it has very little to do with us. And I actually find this liberating. I want to circle back to that in a second. 
Maybe I could explain it like this. There's this really awkward thing we do when we go through a job interview, and maybe you've done this before. But there's a certain point in the interview where the person who's asking the questions will say, what's your greatest weakness? And we know how to play this game, right? Because you don't just like offer up your legitimate greatest weakness. You only offer up what won't disqualify you for the job, right? When that question's answered, when it's asked. And it's like, what's your greatest weakness? You're not going to be like, well, I'm a chronic liar. I'm very, very lazy. And I tend to steal from my employer. Like, <laughs> You know how to play the game. It's, it's called your humble brag. I actually love from the TV show The Office when Michael Scott was interviewing for the corporate job and he goes to New York City and he's with CEO David Wallace and David Wallace says, what do you think your greatest strength is as a manager? Michael Scott, in a pure Michael Scott moment, says, why don't I tell you my greatest weaknesses? I work too hard, I care too much, and sometimes I get too invested in my job. And we might as well call this portion what it actually is. This is the portion of the interview that's the humble brag. It's the moment where you can brag in false humility about your weaknesses. And so I imagine Moses leading God's people to safety and then turning it around and humble bragging about it, right? As if that was the point. Because if it happened today, Moses would have some Twitter account he gets the people through safely and he's, he's checking his phone, he's on Twitter and he's like, exhausted, never skip an arm day, hashtag holding up the Red Sea. Yeah, like, as if it was about Moses. It has nothing to do with Moses. Moses was just an instrument that God used in all of this. Because when we go through the water, God's glory shuts down our tiny little resumes. God's glory shuts down these vain attempts that we have at trying to grab the spotlight. When we go through the water, we remember that this was all about his glory. I mean, verse 4, it just spells it out. I have planned this in order to display my glory. That's the point. And this Foundry Church, I believe, frees us. We're no longer trying to grab the spotlight for our own spiritual resume, our own bragging points. I was laughing with Eric this summer as he was talking about how silly it would have sounded to call this Eric Folker's Ministries. It's not about him. He was the first to say, could you imagine the ridiculousness if this wasn't called Foundry Church and it was called Eric Folker's Ministry? Because it's not about him. It's not about any person on this stage. It's all about his glory, right? And do you see how this frees us? In the same way it would have been ridiculous for Moses to take any credit, any humble bragging going on, in the same way Roger Woodward couldn't be like, I conquered Niagara Falls. There was nothing we did that, that would point to us. And that's the point. All of this is about his glory. We're just, we're just arrows. We're just instruments pointing back to him. In your successes, you point to him. You make him look good. In your failures, you point to him. Students, have you had academic success? Give him that glory. Have you had athletic success? Give him that glory. Have you had success in the workplace? Point it back to him. That's the point. Our lives are given as arrows pointing to the one that is greater than us so that in everything we stop clamoring for the credit and we give it right back and we say to God be the glory. Doesn't matter. It's not about me. I want to point to him. And so whether your life is long and robust or whether it's short, our lives and how we live well and how we die well are spent trying to point to something greater than us. The second thing that I think we take away from this Foundry Church is that if God doesn't show up, and I mean really show up, right? If God doesn't show up, then this is bound to fail. This isn't hyperbole or exaggeration, but if God did not part the Red Sea, this is a massacre. This is a bloodbath. This is potentially the end of the scriptures, right? Because God had made this covenant with his people and he says, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people and this is going to extend from generation to generation to generation unless Pharaoh wipes them all out. This all hinges upon God literally stepping in, right? And this is a crucial point in the story and I love that, that God's plan is big enough to let the turning point hinge on his faithfulness. In other words, it's a no-doubter. It's a no-doubter. Have you ever seen in a baseball game, pitcher offers up 
off a pitch, and, and the hitter just jacks this thing. It's a no-doubter. It's gone. It's leaving the park. And the pitcher, what does he do on a no-doubter? Right after he makes the throw, he just hangs his head. It's a no-doubter. He doesn't even turn around to see if the outfielder is going to make some miraculous play on the ball. He knows it's gone. And I think Exodus 14 gives us an entry point into a no-doubter. God had to have stepped in. Moses didn't have the firepower to engage in a skirmish. There was no salvaging this. This was bound to fail unless God literally stepped in. But can you imagine any circumstance in this whole text where you're like, I think Moses really deserves a lot of credit for this. This is all God. This is pure, unadulterated God on display. And why does he step in? Again, it's for his glory. What does verses 17 and 18 say? My great glory, reference one, will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. When my glory, there it is again, is displayed through them, then all of Egypt will see, guess what? My glory and know that I am the Lord. Sometimes uh, we need it to be redundant to get it, right? But we will see something, that's for sure. We will see something on display and that something isn't going to be Pharaoh and his army, and it's not going to be Moses and his cunning military genius in planning an escape route. They're going to see God stepping into time and place for a people that he promised to be their God. He's going to step into time and place and say, I am your God and I will never leave you or forsake you. And no wonder the outcome has to hinge upon him showing up because it's his glory that's on display. And I think every party knew it that day. I don't think there was a doubt as to who really won the day. I don't think the Egyptians could have been like, man, if we had made a counterattack earlier and then if we had swung up to the north instead and then cut them off. Like, it's just God. It's just the God show, right? That's the point. But let me reframe the question back to us. When was the last time you had so much courage that you stepped into a Red Sea type moment and you just knew that this thing was going to go south in a hurry if God didn't show up, but you set foot anyway. When was the last time that you dreamt about doing something so big for Christ or his kingdom that your prayer was, God, if you don't walk with me through this, this thing's going haywire. When was the last time you had this Red Sea type moment where you knew you had to go through the water and there was no chance of success unless God was with you each step of the way? Can I fill you in on something? This church, if you're a guest here, I love this about this church. If you call this place home, I love this. I was on their website and I stole this next line from their website. But this is a great line from the Foundry's website. The actual statement this church has is this. We choose to obey God, which means we are willing to take risks without guaranteed outcomes. Do you sense the through the waters, even in that belief statement? Risks without guaranteed outcomes. I love that. I love attending a church that believes in risks. I really do. It's that same thought that unless God intervenes in your act of courageous obedience, then it's destined to fail. Unless God intervenes in your act of courageous obedience, it's destined to fail. Unless God walks with us as we step into the unknown, it's going to fall flat on its face. Pastor Mark Batterson pastors a church in Washington, D.C., and he said it like this. I love this quote. I wanted to project it just so you could read it along with me. This is what Mark Batterson said. We want a money-back guarantee before we take a step of obedience. But that eliminates faith from the equation. Sometimes we need to take a flying leap of faith. We need to step into the conflict without knowing if we can resolve it. We need to share our faith without knowing how our friends will react to it. We need to pray for a miracle without knowing how God will answer it. We need to put ourselves in a situation that activates a spiritual gift we've never exercised before. And then I love this closing line, and we need to go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. 
foundry? When was the last time you went after a dream that was destined to fail unless God showed up? I actually heard a story about that. It, uh, it's a sad story. It happened in 2006, tiny little Amish town, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it was one of those stories where you're like, it's, it's a total God thing when you hear what happened. And it was just over 12 years ago. And a man stormed into this tiny Amish school and he killed five students and then he killed himself. And his name was Charlie Roberts. And somebody interviewed his mom about that day. And you have to imagine as a parent what a weird spot this is because your son is dead but you also have the guilt and the shame. Like, it's hard enough to go through mourning and loss, but to do it with guilt and shame, right? But this is what Charlie's mom said about the events of that day. By the time I was at my son's home and I saw my husband and the state trooper standing right in front of me as I pulled in, I looked at my husband and he said, it was Charlie. And you can imagine her world just crashing. Again, that double guilt, shame, and mourning and loss all wrapped into one. And then the father of Charlie said, I will never face my Amish neighbors again. I don't know how you deal with that. I mean, the loss of innocent life, but then as parents, how do you deal with that double whammy of guilt, shame, and mourning and loss. And they said something happened. Of course, they're not going to have a public funeral for their son. He's a school shooter. You're not going to be like, yeah, these are when the memorial times are. And so they had a private ceremony for their son. And again, in a close-knit, small Amish community, like, how do you go on with life? And how do you grieve as parents when you're carrying that? And so they had this private ceremony, and my guess is it was probably going to be like, the parents? Who, like, who else is coming to this thing? And then in an act that could only be described as a God thing, they said as the private ceremony started, they were enclosed. A circle of over 40 of their Amish neighbors <laughs> enclosing them in not a mob, in not a, an act of picketing or protest or rioting or hatred or anything. It was an act of love and they came and they offered forgiveness for this family. And I heard that story and I'm like, destined to fail unless God steps in. How do you offer forgiveness for an evil man who took innocent lives? How do you offer the love of Christ and that type of forgiveness unless God is with you each step of the way? I can't imagine encircling this private memorial service and being like, We're here to forgive you unless God literally was with you every step of the way, right? That is otherworldly love that is destined to fail unless God walks with you like Moses parting the Red Sea or like forgiving a school shooter or like that courageous act of obedience that you yourself know that you're going through. Last thing we can take away from this passage, God is fighting for you, but get moving. Look again at verses 13 through 15 with me. Moses told the people, don't be afraid, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians will see today, will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you, just stay calm. And I love God's response. Like, if there was ever this justification for God the Father, like going, really? You're just going to stand around? Come on. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Loosely translated, God is fighting for you, but do something. Do something. Be a co-laborer with Christ. Get engaged in the fight. Get moving. Don't just stand there. Charles Spurgeon was known in, in church history as being the prince of preachers, And he supposedly had this enormous 20,000 word vocabulary. And one of Charles Spurgeon's most famous sermons was what, basically a mic drop. He said, brethren, do something, do something, do something. Mic drop. 
20,000 word vocabulary and that's all you can come up with? And yes, sometimes that's it. It's like, get going. Do you know that thing that breaks your heart and it keeps you up at night because God's put it there? If you can identify something that makes you mad or angry or you know there's an injustice and you feel like God calling you to get involved in the fight, go. Do you know that thing that causes the Father's heart to rejoice? Get involved there. Whatever the Holy Spirit may be prompting you to do, I want you to put the cues together. (laughs) Tell the people to get moving. Be a co-laborer. See, there's this tendency. There's this tendency when we look at the Exodus story, you look at the water and you're like, this is, this is far beyond in between a rock and a hard place, right? It's water on both sides. It's an army behind you. Like you see it and it looks daunting and it looks uncertain and it looks like, like death is about to happen, like they are being pursued. They said we're being overtaken. But I can't help but think that we're missing a word from this. So yes, it was probably a fairly traumatic experience to have to go through having the Egyptians pursue you and not knowing if you're going to live or die. I don't take that away from this text at all. It was probably a little bit traumatic, if we are honest. But I think the word that we're missing is adventure. Because I don't doubt for a second that every man, woman, and child that lived through the Exodus later in life would oftentimes be staring up at the stars and longing for those days when they are back on that adventure of following God into the unknown. Scary? Yeah, you bet. But it was still the adventure. And I think as we go through the water, it's all about reclaiming the spiritual adventure. And here's the rub, Foundry. Here's here's where it gets personal to me. I know so many people, we work tirelessly the opposite way. We work tirelessly to avoid the risk of having to go through the waters because there is an inherent risk in this, right? If the outcomes are unknown, if it's not guaranteed, there's a risk. But if Christianity is just about being nice or playing it safe or dealing with risk aversion and asset management, then I really don't want anything to do with it. I really don't want to be that tame, domesticated Christ follower that does nothing and risks nothing and where nothing is cost. So I ask you, what happened to that first century radical Christianity that turned the first century upside down? What happened to that category smashing, life-threatening, anti-institutional power that was so threatening? What happened to that gospel spreading like wildfire church? What happened to those Christians whose hearts were on fire, who had no fear, who spoke the truth, no matter the consequence, who were filled with passion and gratitude and every day were unable to get over God's grace? I believe the early church did such a better job of embracing the adventure and I ask you right now, why are our churches so boring? Why are the people of God so boring when a spiritual adventure is offered to us? Connect the dots. Connect the dots from these three takeaways. First thing, it's not about you, right? It's not about your glory. It's not about your resume. It's not about your spiritual spotlight or your bragging points. Okay, so if it's not about you, And secondly, if it's destined to fail unless God intervenes, and then thirdly, God is fighting for you, so do something. Do you see how that liberates us? Connect the dots. What's holding us back? This is the spiritual equivalent foundry of playing with house money, so to speak. You're playing, it's not not about you in the first place. God says he's going to make this happen. And if he doesn't, like it's not going to go anywhere anyway. And then he actually promised that he is fighting on your behalf. So when was the last time you had a spiritual adventure? It's kind of a rhetorical question, kind of not. Let's go down that road. Um, Camp Geneva, fifth grade. That was the last time I had a spiritual... Uh, The Genesis Youth Conference, sophomore year, 1992. Last time I felt like I was on a spiritual adventure. Uh, My conversion, 1988. Maybe you do. Maybe you're in the thick of the adventure. But like I said, I know for so many of us, we're like, yeah, well, it's just what I do. I go to church. No, it's not what we do. Do you see what we're called to? 
Do you see the adventure that's placed before us? Do you see how God is saying, I want you to join me in this fight? What is it? What's the adventure? What's the fight? What's the cause that you need to get behind that God and this Holy Spirit has been prompting you on? Maybe it's something totally, you know, like, I need help for that fight to get through the addiction. Maybe it's to get through the broken relationships. Maybe it's to get through a season of loss. I was talking to another youth pastor the other day. He lives in Akron, Ohio. Last school year, as a youth pastor in his county, there was 17 suicides. And I was like, how on earth could he have gotten through this if God wasn't fighting on his behalf, if God wasn't literally walking with him to get through that. I don't know what your struggle is, but I would invite you to join the journey. I want to be a part of a church that's just soaking wet because we've been so eager to go through the water and to say with courageous obedience, I don't know where you're calling us, but we're not going to miss this for the world. I want to be that church that has no idea where all of you are going to be in the next weeks, months, and years because God has some adventure for you and I hope that you will get moving and join that adventure. Let's pray. Father, you know my tendency is to not stick my neck out on the line. You know my tendency is risk aversion. You know I'd rather play it safe than take a step through the waters. And so forgive us, Father, for all of those times when we've lost sight of the adventure of following you in courageous obedience into the unknown. Forgive us for all the times we wanted it to be guaranteed. Forgive us for all the times we are more concerned with playing it safe in our reputation than your glory being on display. Make us a church, Father, that believes in the no doubter that You are the God walking with us. You are the God fighting for us. You are the God who said, I will never leave or forsake. So impress that upon this, your church, today. In your son's name we pray, amen. Before you go, I don't doubt for a second that there are some of you that know exactly what it means to go through the water and have a Red Sea type moment. I know some of you have just been walking in dependency and trust this whole time through whatever storm or season you've been faced with. Moses, when he got to the other side, the very first thing that scripture tells us that he did is they sang a song to the Lord. They stopped and just gave back to God gratitude for leading them through the water. And this is my closing prayer for you, Foundry Church. It says this, verse chapter 15 I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Foundry Church, as you go this week, may you remember this God that calls us into this adventure, into this relationship of following Christ. May you remember that this is the same God who is your strength and your song, who is your salvation and who is your warrior. Go in that grace and that peace. Have a wonderful week. You are dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.